Okay, we are live. Um, so this is one of my favorite lectures team. I call it the itchies and the scratchies, which is also known as dermatologic problems and athletes. Um, so we'll go over some basic principles, uh, reminding you of all of those derm terms that we used once upon a time uh, during medical school and residency. Then we'll talk about infectious etiologies as well as non-infectious, and then most importantly, um, some prevention. So starting with some basic principles. Uh, from a nomenclature perspective, there are many different terms that are confusing, but once you memorize them are really helpful in describing terms so, or describing lesions. So similar to fractures, our terminology is super important and appropriately relaying what's going on. Same thing applies to uh, skin pathology. So as a quick review, a bulla, remember, is a clear fluid-filled lesion that is greater one centimeter, greater than one centimeter in size. And a vesicle is that fluid-filled lesion that's less than a centimeter. An erosion is a well-defined lesion with partial loss of that epidermis. And then an ulcer, you have complete loss of the epidermis. A macule, remember, is a flat lesion, less than one centimeter, and then a patch is a flat lesion greater than a centimeter. A nodule is a solid deep lesion that can be felt. Uh, and then we have plaques, which are raised greater than one centimeter, uh, and then um, pustules, which is a raised lesion, typically with purulent material inside of it. We also have really good data that will tell us what kind of pathologies to expect in particular sports. So I put this in here not to memorize right now, but really as a reference for you as you study for the, the CAQ later this year. Um, but for example, cycling, we expect friction alopecia, friction bullae, and occlusive acne, as well as exposure to uh, ultraviolet radiation due to their time outside. We can skip down here, say, to weightlifting, where they expect calluses, so friction bullet, contact dermatitis, and MRSA. So again, really predictable types of pathologies by sport. Uh, and then here's that continuation in our team-based sports. So soccer, you can expect contact dermatitis, MRSA, tinea pedis, et cetera. So jumping right into our infectious diseases, uh, let's start with viral infections. And there are three main viral infections I want you to remember. Those are herpes simplex, molluscum contagiosum, and then viral verruca. Uh, all right, Sherilyn, what do you see here? You see a grouping of vesicles, uh, fluid filled, yeah, vesicles uh, on an erythematous piece. Exactly. And what do you think this is? This looks like herpes simplex. Exactly. So herpes simplex um, is epidemic in wrestling and rugby due to the high skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, the infectious agent here is herpes simplex virus, typically type 1. And the pattern is uh, distributed on the head and upper torso of athletes. Uh, symptoms include short prodrome of tingling or itching, and then their lesions become quite painful, can be accompanied by fever and lymphadenopathy. Early, there's a cluster of small vesicles on an erythematous base. Once those vesicles rupture, then you see erosions that will crust over. Um, the diagnosis is often clinical, but if there's any concern, you want to use either a sink smear, a culture, or immunofluorescence for uh, lab confirmation. In terms of treatments, you want to unroof the vesicles and then apply a desiccant. So there are a couple different options, either benzoin or aluminum chloride to try and facilitate drying. And the reason is, remember, once they are unroofed and then dry, they're no longer contagious. Uh, and then in terms of medication therapies, we want to put them on oral valcyclovir. You can put them on 1,000 milligrams twice daily for 10 days for that initial outbreak. And then remember, in recurrent cases, you can actually treat them with a shorter course. There's really good data comparing valcyclovir 2,000 milligrams PO twice a day for one day to our older three and five day regimens and performs just as well. So uh, the one day BID dosing is my go-to now. In terms of prophylaxis, again, say you are a rugby player or a wrestler who has known herpes simplex outbreaks every season, these are people we want to put on prophylaxis in season. So you put them on 500 milligrams of alcyclovir, BID for the duration of their season. 
When it comes to return to play, and this is what you need to know, for each dermatologic infection, there is appropriate treatment course, and then there is an appropriate return to play timeline, okay? So return to play for herpes simplex, they need to have no systemic symptoms, no new lesions for 72 hours. All lesions must have a firm adherent crust, and they need to complete a minimum of 120 hours of systemic antiviral therapy. Active lesions cannot be covered to allow for participation. A couple of confusing points I want to go over here. Uh, so I told you that you should only give them for recurrent cases, valcyclovir, BID for a day. So how does that transfer to 120 hours of systemic antiviral therapy? It's 120 hours since initiation of antiviral therapy. Okay, moving on to our next case. Uh, Lauren, what do you see? I see some skin colored kind of pink papules that might have a little central umbilication. Excellent. And this it looks is like probably molluscum. With... Yep, exactly. So this is molluscum contagiosum. Um, the sports that we see this most commonly in are wrestling and swimming. The pattern of distribution typically is abdomen, face, hands, and thighs. And symptoms are these painless, typically pedunculated lesions. Um, they're relatively small, two to three millimeters with that central dimple or umbilication. Uh, and the diagnosis is, is typically made clinically, uh, although you can send them to the lab for confirmation. Uh, in terms of treatment, a sharp curettage and cauterization of the base is considered curative. You can also treat them with topical agents, so topical amiquimod for a month or systemic rhizofulvin for three to four months. Now, having spent a decent amount of time in our training room and worked with the athletes, as you can imagine, the quickest and uh, least uh, sort of adherence requiring intervention is typically the best. So I typically remember, uh, recommend curatage for these. When it comes to return to play, you need to cure the lesions and you can cover them with a gas perbiomal membrane. Um, so both are reasonable options. All right, back to you, Sherilyn, what do you see? So I see um, white, that's a white, Erosion is hard to tell kind of size of the plantar surface with the foot. Yep. And what do you think this is? Um, these look like, oh, these look like plantar warts. Exactly. It's centralized black. Yeah. Absolutely. So these are viral veruca. So the sports involved is really all contact, all sports with contact activities weightlifting especially because of the trauma that it causes to the hands. Um, and distribution is typically on the hands and the soles of the feet. Uh, symptoms, they can be mildly painful, typically because of the hyperkeratosis. That hyperkeratosis creates pressure into the deeper structures uh, under the skin and can cause pain. Um, and on appearance, they're well-defined verrucous plaques and papules. Uh, they're diagnosed um, really based on that classic appearance. Um, but they have those pinpoint hemorrhages. Uh, that's what those little black dots inside are. They're actually little micro hemorrhages because of the uh, aggressive neovascularization that we see in these lesions. When it comes to treatment, your options are excision, cryosurgery, bleomycin injections, salicylic acid, or topical amiquimod. And of course, there's the homeopathic topical duct tape. Um, uh, athletes, by the way, are allowed to participate with viral veruca. Okay, so let's switch gears now to bacterial infections. There are four main bacterial infections I want to review today. These include impetigo, folliculitis and furunculosis, pitted keratolysis, and erythrasma. All right, Lauren, back to you. What do you see? See yellow crusting over an erythematous, I guess erythematous macules that that coalesce, but it looks like impetigo. Absolutely. So that classic honey crusting lesions, skip lesions all over the place. 
Uh, okay, so the infectious agent in impetigo is typically staph or strep. Um, the distribution pattern is usually the head, neck, and extremities. Uh, and symptoms are, most importantly, pain disproportionate to exam. If you have never suffered through impetigo, good for you. Um, but it really is an exquisitely painful infection. Um, and again, you have those scattered skip or island lesions all over the place. Uh, the appearance, early you'll have these erythematous sores, or potentially pustules, and then later you get those really classic well-defined erythematous plaques with the yellow honey crusting. This is a clinical diagnosis for the most part uh, and responds very well if caught early and localized with topical mupirocin ointment BID, if it's more systemic, or typically uh, when I see it involving the face, I tend to treat more aggressively with oral agents, so you can use Keflex TID or doxycycline TID. For athletes that you see this recurrently in, there's good data looking at prophylaxis. Uh, so they've compared bleach baths to topical chlorhexidine soap or washes. The data is better, honestly, for bleach baths, but compliance with a bleach bath is much poorer. Uh, so I'll recommend Hibiclens, which is that topical chlorhexidine uh, soap. Uh, one to two times per week for an athlete who's in season and getting recurrent infections. When it comes to return to play, they need to have no systemic symptoms, no new lesions for 48 hours, no further, further drainage or exudate, and have completed 72 hours of antibiotic treatment. Uh, active lesions of impetigo cannot be covered to allow participation, so get them on antibiotics ASAP. All right, back to you, Sherilyn. What do you see? All right, I see erythematous, um, kind of nodular with a scab, uh, yeah, scab over the top. And this is consistent with? Infilliculitis. Yep, and these those big ones may progress to furuncles. Furuncles. Yeah, so folliculitis or furunculosis. Uh, the infectious agent here, again, is staph and strep. Uh, skin trauma is going to predispose individuals to this, as well as skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, we see this pretty regularly in our team-based sports, so 20% of basketball players, 25% of football players. Football, you can imagine all the friction from their uh, pads. Um, and on, on appearance, they're painful, hairy follicular pustules with that erythematous base. For the fur uncles, they'll actually turn to tender fluctuant nodules. Uh, the diagnosis is made clinically again, typically, and you want to treat them for seven to 10 days. For folliculitis, you want to treat with Keflex and add Bactrim. Remember, we want to cover for MRSA, which is very common in the athletic population. Uh, for furuncles, you want to IND those so once they become large and fluctuant. I know you've uh, already started to handle these in training room. IND it, send a culture just to make sure that it's not some kind of strange organism, and then get them started on oral antibiotics. For those who are colonized, you want to consider a decolonization regimen. So you can use the mupirocin ointment, uh, BID, and that goes into the nares for seven to 14 days. I'm just uh, touching on MRSA really briefly, uh, incredibly common again in the athletic population. So found in 22% of wrestling infections, there was a four-fold increase in MRSA between 1998 and 2002. So that in a little short four-year window, and recurrence is related to colonization. So we see 44% eradication with mupirocin in the nares, 28% eradication with chlorhexidine. Again, if you understand your athletic population, trying to get an athlete to put an antibiotic ointment into their nose twice a day for an extended period of time is unlikely, but putting a special kind of soap in the shower, much more likely. So while the data is better with mupirocin, adherence tends to be better with chlorhexidine. So when it comes to return to play, uh, no systemic symptoms, no new lesions for 48 hours, no further drainage or exudate, and 72 hours of antibiotic treatment. So uh, similar to our impetigo. And then active lesions cannot be covered. Okay, Lauren, I think you're up. Um, so a lot of, it looks like kind of hyperkeratinized 
um, papules over the, the base of the foot. And I can't remember the exact name of it, but it's Carita something um, that you mentioned earlier. Excellent. Yeah, so we see this really distinct, they almost look like wet, hyperkeratotic sort of pits. Uh, this is called pitted keratolysis. So distribution is on the soles of the feet. Um, predisposing factors are really maceration after long exposure to moist, warm, occlusive conditions, i.e. in a sock, in a shoe, sweating a lot for an extended period of time. So this is most commonly seen in uh, court sports. So tennis, basketball, where there's a lot of quick cutting, lots of sweating, but lots of friction on the feet as well. The infectious agent here is either corny bacterium or a micrococcus species. Uh, and on appearance, it has really discrete pits. But if you have ever seen this in person, the foul odor will get you from across the room. You, you will smell it before you will even see it. Um, and so it, really the odor plus those discrete pits are, are classic for it. You wanna treat this with topical clindamycin or erythromycin. And then on the prophylactic side, our newer synthetic socks are actually much better at moisture wicking versus the older cotton versions. And then avoidance of prolonged occlusion in athletic shoes. So immediately after practice, get your shoes off, get your socks off, wear some sandals to allow the feet to get uh, some air exposure. All right, uh, what do you see, Sherilyn? Um, I see a erythematous patch with a little bit of centralized clearing. Um, looks like maybe some maceration of the skin as well. Absolutely, and I believe this is an axilla, but could be any really intertriginous region. Okay, so this is erythrasma, which is a chronic intertriginous bacterial infection. The infectious agent is corny bacterium, um, and it has that really classic, sharply demarcated reddish brown plaque. Uh, you probably remember this from medical school under the woods lamp, it turns coral red. Um, so you can see that with the bottom image on the right side of the screen. Uh, and we wanna treat these with topical erythromycin, BID, or oral erythromycin if it's more disseminated. Uh, this unique infection actually can be covered for participation. Most of the time, given the regions that it is, it's sort of innately covered. Uh, but you're going to see this in your uh, sports that favor larger athletes that then lend themselves to intertriginous folds. Okay, switching gears from bacteria to fungal infections. Four major fungal infections we want to talk about all the tinea, so corporis, capitis, versicolor, and pedis. All right, Lauren, what do you see? I see an erythematous plaque with central clearing, and then there's also some scaling around the edge of it, and it looks like tinea. Tinea corporis. Tinea section, it's tinea. All right, so uh, tinea corporis is incredibly common in contact sports. We see this in 24 to 70% of wrestling teams. The infectious, infectious agent is typically trichophyton tonsurans and has that classic appearance, well-defined erythematous scaling plaques. And as it spreads, you'll start to see central clearing. The diagnosis is made via KOH skin scraping under microscopy, which is relatively sensitive and very specific. Uh, and our treatment here is either topicals or orals. Um, again, depending on the dissemination, but I just wanted to give you a data point on the orals, which is oral fluconazole, 150 milligrams POQ week times three weeks has a 100% cure rate. So if you're starting with a topical and they just don't seem to be getting better, uh, absolutely consider just switching them to a very short course oral treatment. Uh, when it comes to the topicals, you can use myconazole, ketoconazole, or terbenafine. They're doing this BID for a number of weeks. Um, relative to the orals. Uh, you can also put athletes on prophylaxis again in season, uh, depending on how often they're seeing these infections. When it comes to return to play, they need to be on a topical antifungal or oral for at least 72 hours, and lesions must be adequately covered with gas permeable membrane. So you may cover tinea for return to play. 
Okay, uh, what do we have here? I believe you're up, Cheryl. Um, so you have a patch, it seems like the center of the scalp um, that has maybe some scaling and reduced hair growth. What do you think it is? It's, um, it's a <laughs> I am trying to think, is it like, it seems almost like, sor what is it? Similar to like psoriasis, psoriatic or no? It is tinea capitis. This is a really bad case. You never see it yeah. that bad. <laughs> Um, okay, so again, our infectious agent here is trichophyton tonsurans. The appearance is those scaly erythematous lesions with or without alopecia. Um, the hair that has not yet fallen out or broken appears discolored, lusterless, brittle, and they tend to break because of all that brittleness that they, they break. They call them the exclamation point hairs, remember? Um, so on diagnosis, it's typically done again, KOH skin scraping under microscopy. Treatment for this is not topical, so only orals because of the fact that it's so embedded in the hair follicle. Uh, you need an oral agent and it takes pretty extensive amount of treatment. So if you look at our agents here, graziofulvin, terbenafine, itraconazole, we're treating daily for weeks to months to really truly eradicate that infected follicle. So. Uh, we don't see this nearly as often as tinea corporis, but you will occasionally and just counsel your athletes that it's going to take some time and they just need to stick with the, the treatments to make sure they eradicate the full infection. So return to play is a minimum of two weeks on oral antifungal treatment. And again, here's a couple more of those more advanced cases. Very rare you'll see it this advanced. All right, Lauren, what do you see? Um, there is, it looks like hypopigmented lesions. There's both patches and some macules. Um, and this is also a tinea infection. I can't remember the, the exact name of it though, but it's um, a tinea infection. Yes. Tinea versicolor. Okay, so this is a really interesting infection. Very common. You'll see it you'll quote, see it most commonly in athletes, warmer weather uh, when they're becoming tan, um, but uh, you know, it can be present year round. The infectious agent is Malesthesia furfur. This is a normal skin flora, uh, but it typically appears in highest numbers where there's high sebaceous activity. So think of the T-zone on the chest and similar zone on the back. Um, the presentation is hypopigmented macules. And now a couple of things I want you to understand about these hypopigmented areas. The reason the tissue becomes hypopigmented is that the malesthesia furfur stun the melanocytes. So they actually, the way that they transiently damage them, the melanocytes become inactive. So because of that, once you treat the infection adequately, which does take a number of uh, weeks, it will take months for those melanocytes to wake back up and start to create skin pigment. So there is a lag between eradication of the infection and resolution of the discoloration. So again, really important to counsel athletes that this will take time, it will go away, but we have to kill the infection and then allow the skin to recover. There's also a pretty wide differential with this. So when I, we see this in athletes, we, we jump immediately to tinea versicolor, but keep in mind that there are other things that can mimic this. They include vitiligo, pityriasis alba, seborrheic dermatitis, syphilis, and pityriasis rosea. When it comes to treatment, the textbook tells you that you need three to seven days of topical ketoconazole shampoo or selenium sulfide shampoo. I will tell you, having treated hundreds of these cases, that it really takes weeks. So I will prescribe this shampoo, tell the athlete to think of this as their new body wash, use two to three times a week for a month, and that it'll take them another month or two for the skin to really go back to normal once they've been treated. If you've treated them for a solid month, give it another mm -hmm. month for the melanocytes to wake up and it's still not improving, then you can consider oral medication. But again, because it's not really contagious, really just cosmetic, I try to stick to the topicals here. 
Okay, Sherilyn, what do you see? I'm seeing scattered plaques, I would say, of the plantar surface of the foot. Um, what would you call this? It seems like it's athlete's foot. Athlete's foot or tinea pedis. So the infectious agent here is trichophyton rubrum. Now, the one thing I want you to be really cognizant of is the superimposed bacterial infections. So the, the tinea that they will get uh, can cause cracks in the skin. And then remember, in a dark, moist, wet shoe, uh, you can get a superimposed bacterial infection over that skin breakdown. So the, the image here on the right side of the screen shows skin breakdown from the tinea and then a superimposed bacterial infection that's typically in the web spaces of the toes. This is seen more commonly in men than women. Young adulthood is the most common uh, age and they present with that dry, scaly, fissured skin, but that can become macerated and soggy again with a bacterial super infection. So check the toe webs, check the soles of the feet. Pruritus is often that presenting symptom, especially in young men who've never bothered to look at the bottom of their feet. So treatment responds really well to topicals, um, but if they're failing topicals, we want to provide an oral second line and then obviously treat any concurrent bacterial infections with an uh, antibiotic. Okay, switching gears to the creepiest of all of our infections are the parasitic infections. So the two we'll cover today are swimmer's itch and cutaneous larva migrants. Lauren, what do you see? I see many, many diffuse, um, it looks like papules, but they might be pustules for some of them um, that are erythematous. And this looks like swimmer's itch to me. You are correct. So the infectious agent here are schistosomes. Um, and this is also called circarial dermatitis. It's a little bit complicated to understand the life cycle of these um, agents. So I, I wanna dive into it a bit. Birds are the definitive host. Snails are the intermediate host. Humans are an accidental bystander in the whole process. The reason we develop these symptoms is actually an allergic reaction to the organism. So in one to five hours, you'll develop mild itching, those macular eruptions. In 10 to 15 hours, it becomes quite intense itching with papules, and this can continue for about a week. Because we are not an appropriate host, we kind of got caught in the life cycle of this, this uh, infectious agent, uh, it's not communicable. But risk factors include repetitive water exposure or shallow water immersion. So because it's not communicable and it's just gonna die on its own, we're not the appropriate host, it's not supposed to live and thrive in and on us, uh, you just treat the symptoms with oral antihistamines, topical corticosteroids. So this is the swimmer's itch life cycle. So you have these adult worms are gonna produce eggs that are swallowed and passed in the feces of ducks. On exposure to water, those eggs are gonna hatch, liberate the organism called the myricidium. That myricidium is then gonna infect snails, underwater snails, which are the intermediate host. Uh, that intermediate host is going to release these free swimming organisms called the circariae. So these are the ones that are gonna get us as humans. And these are released into the water from the snail. Those circariae are seeking out warm-blooded hosts, typically birds, but occasionally humans swimming in the ocean or in the lakes. Uh, but they can't survive in us, so they just burrow into the skin, cause a painful histaminergic response, and then they die, and your body clears it away, which is totally gross and highly pruritic. Okay, now that we've all got the itchies, Let's move to the scratchies. Uh, Sherilyn, what do you see? Yeah, serpiginous erythematous uh, rash of the dorsal surface of the foot. What do you think it is? Some type of parasite. <laughs> um, larva. Give me a hint. Yes. Cutaneous larva migrants. So this infectious agent 
is impossible for me to pronounce, uh, but there's a Brazilian version and a Caninum version. Um, seen very commonly in the Caribbean, Central South America, and Asia. It is very rare in the US. So have a higher suspicion for this infection and in athletes who have traveled overseas for competition. Symptoms typically unilateral, serpiginous, pruritic eruption on the hands, feet, or buttocks. Again, buttocks from sitting in the sand. And the risk factors are direct contact with contaminated sand or soil. The rare but important complication from this infection is called Loeffler syndrome, which is migratory pulmonary infiltrates and peripheral eosinophilia. So those pulmonary infiltrates can be quite severe and cause hospitalization. Uh, the treatment, it's typically self-limiting, but we obviously want to accelerate our body's ability to fight off the parasitic infection. So you can treat it with oral albendazole, 400 milligrams a day for three days, oral, oral ivermectin, very hard to come by these days since the underworld has convinced it treats COVID, but that is 200 milligrams daily for two days. You can also use topical uh, thiabendazole. Personally, I opt for a very short course of an oral agent. Okay, let's shift gears entirely away from all of our infections. Now talk about non-infectious dermatologic issues of which there are many. All right, Lauren, what do you see? A reddish brown plaque on the plantar surface of the foot. And this looks like um, there was probably like a, not a blood blister, but a little bit of blood deposition underneath the skin from trauma. Excellent. So our nifty term for this is talon noir or black heel because it's most commonly seen on the heel and young adults. So this is really, just as Lauren described, blood collected in the, the dermal layers. So this is horizontal petechiae, typically on the heel, but uh, can also be in the ball of the foot within the stratum corneum. Um, it is seen in sports with frequent stops and starts. So think court sports, tennis, racquetball, basketball. Uh, and symptoms are this benign, painless, weird looking spot on your foot that resolves spontaneously. Uh, you you want to have melanoma in the back of your mind, uh, in your differential. Obviously, we would not want to miss a melanoma and just call it Talon Noir accidentally. So if there's any concern, you can actually do a skin scraping, mix it with saline, and test it for occult blood because these are petechiae. So it should test positive for blood with a simple skin scraping versus melanoma obviously would not. So here's another more classic example on the heel, but you can see how that could be really easily confused for a melanoma. Okay, Sherilyn, what does John have? Seems like he's got maceration of the nipple. He's got blood on his shirt. Exactly, <laughs> he has joggers nipples. Uh, so, <laughs> These seem silly, but let me tell you, if you've ever run a long race in a wrong shirt, it can be quite miserable. Uh, so this is raw, painful, eroded skin over the nipple. It is most commonly seen in men, long distance runners. Typically women are protected by their sports bras, which have much better cushioning and better material. Um, pathophysiology is friction between the nipple and the shirt fabric during a run. So your options are join the shirtless mafia and run shirtless or cover your nipples with either a Band-Aid or some jelly to try and lubricate the area. All right, Lauren, what do you see? I see some thickened skin and then some fresh skin that it looks like the it peeled off the epidermal layer. So and this is a blister that has popped. Yeah, so we get that. What we can imagine, there used to be a fluid-filled layer of macerated skin now completely removed with exposed dermis underneath. So blisters um, obviously caused by repetitive friction or new or poorly fitting shoes. So anytime your university changes its allegiances via brand, be on the lookout for blisters. Um, the location is really sports dependent, but most commonly seen on the feet. 
Uh, and typically you want to manage these closed. So if they're, you, you can open them and drain them if they're large. Um, blisters, as silly as they seem, can really take an athlete out of competition for an extended period of time. So again, prophylaxis is going to be key. You want to break in the shoes gradually, wear two pair of socks initially if there's space for it. And then there are these really nice hydrocolloid anti-friction products. But uh, if you catch a blister, say like this one on the great toe early, I would recommend aspiration. What aspiration does is it removes the fluid. It allows that epidermal layer to lay back down against the dermis. And then you can try some of your uh, anti-friction products over the top. Um, and you can continue to drain them up to three times in the first 24 hours. And that's going to speed that healing process and allow the athlete to return to play. So for those of you covering court sports, these will be quite common um, and be prepared and ready to drain them as needed. All right, uh, Sherilyn, are you up? I think so, I guess. Um, I really hate it. It's been a recent increased nodules of the year with the cauliflower ear. Yeah, so this is our fancy medical term, subperichondral hematomas. Uh, affectionately known in the wrestling community as cauliflower ear. So this is commonly seen on the ears of wrestlers uh, and rugby players due to trauma. Pathophysiology is that there is a blood clot, a hematoma that organizes and forms into new cartilage within the anterior ear. Um, if you recognize this early, you can actually aspirate this with a needle, apply a compressive device, and it is curative. It's pretty magical if you can get to these fast. If the trauma has been repeated, recurrent, and they have this cartilage formation, the only way to treat it is with a plastic surgery to remove all of that neocartilage formation. So early intervention is really, really key, similar to you know, a thigh hematoma or any other hematoma in the body. If you can aspirate it immediately, it's curative, but if you let it sit there and coagulate, it's gonna be much more complicated. So here's an image of a really simple aspiration of cauliflower ear. Uh, you want to use a little local anesthesia, 18 gauge needle, and then aspirate all the um, blood product. And then you need to compress. So the, the classic teaching was you'd sew a button onto the ear to, to compress the, the skin back down to the cartilage. Uh, they make these really clever magnet devices. So you can absolutely spare them a, uh, a stitch through the ear with a button and just use two magnets on the front of the back of the ear. All right, what do we see here, Lauren? Um, I see, it looks like some striated skin um, and it's either from an old injury that, that's scarring, but I think it's more likely stretch marks. Exactly, so what is our fancy term for this? Strie distense. Uh, so, these stretch marks most often occur secondary to rapid growth, um, can be seen on the breasts of women, the pregnant abdomen, arms and thighs of teenagers, uh, typically with rapid muscle growth. The classic appearance is these violaceous linear atrophic streaks. They're typically asymptomatic. They just don't like the cosmesis. The treatment here is really nothing awesome, right? When we have many okay treatments, it's usually a sign that we don't have one really good treatment. And so you can use various laser therapies, topical tretinoins can use, be used to slowly dissipate these lesions with time, but really prevention is gonna be the most important. So good skin moisturization, trying to slow the stretching of the skin. If you were seeing these in your high school athletes, and this is a really important note, have a high concern for anabolic steroid use, okay? So these are very, very commonly associated with anabolic steroid use in teenagers. And so if you've got a football player or a wrestler or a strength-based sport that you're starting to see some early signs of stretch marks, screen for anabolic steroid use, counsel about the challenge in treating these uh, short and long-term. All right, what do you see here? Um, let's see, white, central, like centralized white um, patch or 
macular maybe with erythematous border. Um, why I'm thinking on what this might be. All right, so this is a really interesting pathology mm -hmm. that yeah. fall, falls on the spectrum of cold exposure. Um, so that, that image was actually pernia. We'll talk about that last. But uh, cold exposure is a spectrum similar to heat illness. Cold illness has a similar spectrum of pathology ranging from frost nip to frost bite and then sort of parallelly uh, pernio. So frost nip is freezing of the skin and superficial subcutaneous tissues. It's the most common form of cold injury. Symptoms include numb white areas of skin for up to 72 hours. And the treatment here is gentle rewarming and the use of warm, damp compresses or running water. Um, frost bite is a deeper tissue injury that progresses from numbness to blisters and ultimately necrosis. Treatment is rapid rewarming. Water needs to be between 39 and 44 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes. And after the cold injury has been appropriately treated, the affected area often remains cold sensitive for months to years. Uh, so be sure that you're counseling your patients and athletes that this may persist for a while. Um, pernio is a parallel pathology that is caused by localized areas of vasoconstriction in cold and humid clients. So it's really a unique uh, climate that this will occur in. So cold plus humidity that results in these painful nodules. It's more commonly seen in women than men and exposed extremities are most at risk. Symptoms will include paresthesias and pruritus. So just going back to that picture again, you can see this is what that classic perineo is gonna look like. Um, so here is your spectrum of cold exposure. You've got frost nip, so that's more superficial injury. We've got frost bite, which is a deeper injury with necrosis, and then pernia, which is more of that blistering sort of wet frost nip or frost bite. Okay, what do you see, Lauren? Um, there are many, it looks like erythematous macules that are coalescing, and they're very erythematous. And this looks, I, I don't know the formal name for it, but from heat, like heat rash. Excellent. So this is urticaria. And uh, you appropriately pointed out one of our many triggers. So urticaria is, or hives, is can occur in response to many different things. So there is an exercise induced form, commonly seen in runners and endurance athletes. There is a cholinergic form response to increased body temperature. So that's that classic heat rash. Uh, there is an aquagenic form, which we can see in swimmers, although I, I don't think you'll be long for the sport of swimming if you have a uticarial response to water. Um, there is cold induced from ice or cold temperatures. And these presents with these well-defined edematous, erythematous plaques with associated pruritus. Um, we treat this with antihistamines, although you'll see a variable response. Systemic steroids are typically not effective. You'll often see them prescribed, but really the data shows they don't make a huge difference. And the lesions will typically remit spontaneously within 24 hours. Um, signs of difficulty breathing, swallowing, or talking, now we're worried about anaphylaxis, which is a more significant pathology and that needs to be treated urgently. Um, but if it's limited exclusively to skin-related uh, symptoms, you know, you can monitor, try antihistamines, typically don't need steroids. All right, what do we see here? Numerous um, the papules or, um, of, yeah, there's a pop. Yeah, so we have this scattered appearance of papule, pustules, erythematous base uh, over the shoulders and mid-back region. This is what we call acne mechanica. So it's an occlusive obstruction of that follicular pilosebaceous unit um, related to our equipment that we're using in sports. So the appearance, they'll have these pustular eruptions in the distribution of the occlusive equipment. 
Risk factors are warm, moist environments and sports that require this kind of equipment. So you can imagine any sport requiring shoulder pads or a helmet with a chin strap. So football being classic, lacrosse as well, hockey as well. Um, you'll see this over the shoulders, the back or the chin again, depending on the, the play, place and position of the equipment. Treatment, you wanna treat this with topical keratolytics, salicylic acid uh, being our initial line as well as topical antibiotics. So topical clindamycin is great to treat that underlying uh, propriano acne bacteria. All right, I believe we're coming to the end. Lauren, what do you see here? I see nodules that maybe look a little hyperkeratotic and are mildly erythematous over, it looks like the flex, the flexure surfaces, is that, is that eczema? Good, uh, good thought, but no. So this, if we look really closely, other than that little bit of erythema on the skin, the skin is actually pretty, pretty normal. These are deeper nodular um, pathologies. So these are called athletic nodules. Um, they are really collagenomas that form, so it's fibroconnective tissue deeper into the dermal layers, and they're caused by repetitive friction, pressure, or trauma over bony prominences. Uh, sports, we see this commonly as boxing over the knuckles. Surfing, we'll see it over the tibial tuberosity. And then on the dorsal aspect of the feet, in hockey, we call that skate bite. Um, the treatment here is really protective padding and taping to try and reduce the pressure directly over those bony prominences. Uh, so you can see the image here on the bottom right has a foam pad that can be inserted underneath the tongue of a skate to try and take some of the pressure off of that tibial prominence there. So really prophylaxis is the best intervention. If an athlete presents already with these large nodules, you can do intralesional steroid injections as a first line to try and cause some necrosis and shrinking of those lesions. Uh, if it's refractory to uh, ILK, then you want to try excision. Okay, I believe this is our final one. What do you see, Sherilyn? See white papules of the heel. Um, and I forget what this is called. Pesiogenic papules. So these are flesh colored papules uh, with weight bearing over the lateral aspects of the heel. They're caused by herniation of the subdermal fat into the dermis, most commonly seen in endurance athletes. Uh, and the symptoms, again, are really just the appearance. They're typically asymptomatic. If they do become painful, uh, it's because the nerve, those little superficial nerves, are herniating through the dermis with that subdermal fat. Um, treatment, you want to do protective padding or taping over the heel. You can try heel cups, or if they become painful, you can use intralesional steroid injections. It'll cause that little bit of fat necrosis and that lesion to shrink back down. Okay, let's switch gears to prevention now. So really you want to have a culture of safety in the locker room. So starting with the medical team, emphasizing hand hygiene, decontaminating the examination room before and after patient contact. You know, when you're washing your hands, 15 seconds thoroughly dry. So making sure that we are not the transmitting agent from athlete to athlete and making sure that our equipment is, is sterile and safe. From an athlete perspective, you want them using antimicrobial soaps for the, over the entire body immediately following practice. You wanna discourage cosmetic body shaving. This is gonna cause a six times increased risk of skin infections. And then when we think about the training room, we wanna be cleaning it rigorously and appropriately. So using a one to 10 ratio of household bleach to tap water for disinfecting all the surfaces. I'll show you in a minute, there's a really nice cleaning schedule chart and then deep cleaning your soiled textiles or towels, our sheets, our, our uniforms, et cetera. This is here as a study guide for you, but it really is telling you which part of the training room and locker room needs to be cleaned with what frequency. Okay, so quick review of sports dermatology. 
many different infectious agents that we will see in our athletes. And I included this here as a really nice snapshot for you to study heading into boards, looking at diagnosis, treatment agent, dosages, frequency, and duration. So burn this into your mind's eye before you take the CAQ. When it comes to return to play, it is very important to know amount of time they must be treated, what the lesion needs to look like, and whether or not it can be covered for participation, okay? So the fungal versus the viral versus the bacterial will each have different recommendations. You need to know these very well. And with that, we'll open it up for some very brief questions, and then you gotta hop off to your next lecture. <laughs>